So here's just graphical representations, as I mentioned before. 51% of schools teach the Nanjing, that's the blue, so it's pretty much split down the middle, and 49% don't teach the Nanjing in any capacity. But if we look at the accredited schools teaching the Nanjing as a requirement, just a measly 10% there, which amounts to literally five schools out of 49. Um, then, I, then I looked at the class type at eligible schools, so this is the 25 schools that were eligible to participate. 17 of them are teaching it as part of a broader class, three as an elective and five as a requirement. So as you can see, the vast, ma the vast majority of schools are teaching the Nanjing as part of a broader class. Same general picture when we look at the participating schools. These are the 12, responses, 12 response, uh, schools that I, that I get responses from. Seven teach it as part of another class, one as an elective, and four as a requirement. So others still being the number one reason. So the, this was really what I did all the research. This, this is what it came down to. The ten most popular chapters. Siwan chapter one got votes from everyone that, I, that returned the ballot. My thinking on this is, well, it's the first chapter of the Siwan, which is traditionally thought of as the first book of the name Jing. So it makes sense that you would choose this because it's the intro to the whole book. It tells you who the Yellow Emperor is, and it also gives you a very general sense of Chinese medicine is about you know, prevention and about helping our patients get, get in the flow of the seasonal energetics. That, that's a good portion of what Su Wen Chapter 1 is about. And it also includes some very interesting uh, information about male and female qi cycles. So the idea that women are on seven-year cycles of qi and men are on eight-year cycles of qi. Um, so Su Wen Chapter 1 got the most votes. Su Wen Chapter 5 got second most votes, and this was no surprise to me. The quote that I chose to open the presentation was from Su Wen Chapter 5. A lot of times my colleagues know the research that I'm doing. They would ask me, well, I don't have time to do the amount of research you're doing on the Nanjing. What should I do? And I told them, just read Su Wen Chapter 5 a whole bunch. Because Su Wen Chapter 5 talks about yin yang theory, it talks about wuxing, the five phase theory, it talks about um, herb theory, herbal theory as well. Just, it, I, I really feel like you can understand most of Chinese medicine only by Su Wen Chapter 5, so that was no surprise. And then the, the third most voted for chapter was Su Wen Chapter 2. Again, very much a theoretical chapter about understanding the seasonal energetics, understanding that. Now that it's summertime, we've got longer days, so it's okay to stay up a little bit later and get up um, at a reasonable hour, as opposed to in the wintertime when we should be going to bed early, we should be following those natural cycles. And then, in terms of breakdown, uh, for those of you who don't know, there are two books of the Neijing. There's the Su Wen portion, and there's the Wing Chu portion. There's 81 chapters in each, so 162 chapters total. 86% of the votes were for the Su Wen, chapter, uh, Su Wen chapters. My thought on this is that the Ling Shu is a great manual and a great book about how to become a proficient acupuncturist and a great practitioner, but I think you need the foundation that's laid out in the Su Wen before you can really get to the Ling Shu. So my, my feeling, without actually having concrete evidence, is that people chose the Su Wen because if you're only going to teach a small portion at the master's level, let's focus on these foundational chapters. And all the chapters that were chosen were very foundational. So before I introduce my curriculum design, I thought it would be prudent to use this quote from Zhang Jiaodong, who's a Chinese elder um, of, of the medicine. Uh, if you're familiar with Heiner Fruhauf and his site, Classical Chinese Medicine, um, Heiner does an interview with him. This is, uh, I transcribed this from one of his interviews. He says, the true nature of Chinese medicine comes from a time that is a time of synthesis. The only way to do this justice is to find a type of educational model where you read the classics of this medicine that were written at the time when this synthesis occurred. So again, this is very much like that notion that my teacher, Kevin Ju, used to say. Let's, we need to get in the mind of the sages that wrote this book. So for my curriculum design, these were my goals. 
I wanted this course to be designed to fit into one semester's time. The, the curriculum is going to focus on the 10 chapters that receive the most votes. So those are the chapters that receive more than three votes. Um, 10 chapters ended up being about ideal for a one semester class because some of the chapters are a bit bulkier and require two classes to fully cover. And then I incorporated multiple English translations of the Neijing. This, I felt, was necessary because, we're, as, I, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're all sort of at a disadvantage in the Western world of East Asian medicine if we don't read Chinese. So the only way we can hope, in my opinion, to approach what is being said is to use multiple English translations to look at, well, how did Paul Unschuld translate this passage? How did um, Ilse Weith, who was the first person to translate the Suwen in, in, into English, translate this passage? And then compare those. It also facilitates class discussion when you're able to look at different renderings of the same passage. And then finally, I wanted to include supplementary material from other classics of the time. So things like the Tao Te Ching, or Zhuangzi, or the Huainanzi, um, things that, books that are foundational parts of Chinese culture, um, the, the works of Confucius, the Confucian classics, and then also modern scholarship. So my goal is Although it could be considered a reductionist approach to only focus on 10 chapters, my, my intention was we're going to study those 10 chapters as deeply as possible. So here would be an example of what um, a slide or a few slides from the curriculum would look like. Um, I, I, I generated, um, as part of this research, I generated three classes worth of PowerPoints which cover the like, introduction to the Neijing, Chapter, Suwen Chapter 1 and Suwen Chapter 2. I also generated um, a course syllabus and a teaching manual for how to approach this. So here's an example of what the class would look like. Chivo, this is from Suwen Chapter 1. Chivo replied, The men of high antiquity observed the way, modeled themselves on yin yang, and attained harmony through practice and number. Eating and drinking had their limit. Activity and rest had their norm not exhausting themselves thoughtlessly, body and spirit held together. Having reached the natural lifespan, they departed at a hundred years of age. So basically, a, a simple quote on how to live a long and healthy life. Um, that's Claude Lars' translation. Now typically I would have translations from several other scholars, but I didn't want to overwhelm you with, with data. So after four other translations of that same passage, then I gave a summary of all those passages. In ancient times, the sages lived in harmony with the universe. They followed natural cycles and embraced the principles of yin and yang. As a result of their sophisticated understanding of natural cycles, they built their lives on the principles of harmony and temperance and lived a full life. Then we're going to look at other books of the time, how they described the same sages. Because I think it's really important for students to understand the Neijing is not this compartment of Chinese culture, like a repository of Chinese medical literature that's divorced from everything else. It's really, truly just an extension of a greater cultural movement that was happening at the time. So I always try to reinforce this in the curriculum. So I've got a quote from the Huainanza, which was lit written literally at roughly the same time as the Neijing. Therefore it is said, the sages in their life act in accord with heaven, in their death transform with other things, in tranquility share the potency of the yin, in activity share the surge of the yang. And then from the Nege, which is an even older text, therefore the sage alters with the seasons but doesn't transform, shifts with things but doesn't change places with them. Again, my goal here is to give the students a sense of the Neijing is part of something bigger. And the more pieces of that puzzle we can understand, the better we're going to be able to understand the name chain. So in terms of my conclusion, the Suen portion received the majority of votes um, greater than 85%. And, and this last piece is really remarkable to me. 10 out of 162 chapters received three or more votes um, out of a pool of eight people that were giving me votes. So that's actually quite remarkable in, in my mind. 
In terms of implications and recommendations from this research, as many of you probably know, some schools are transitioning toward an FPD, which is the first professional doctorate. ACOM just started accepting applications last year for this first professional doctorate. So FPD programs and current DAOM programs do provide an opportunity for curriculum design and reevaluation. I think that's really important because a good majority of my colleagues that I started the DAOM with they never had exposure to the name Jing. So my curriculum could actually be employed at a doctoral level for students that never had any exposure to the name Jing. Secondly, obviously, my major contention here, the name Jing should be considered for inclusion in more curricula at schools of East Asian medicine. And finally, this was a pioneering study. Additional research into the name Jing is needed. Um, pedagogical is just a fancy way of saying teaching methodology, basically. Um, some ideas for further research that I would like to see other people embrace. Using a very similar model to the one that I employed, what are the most important chapters in the Ling Shu? Give me the ten most important chapters in the Ling Shu for master's level students. Give me the, most, the ten most clinically relevant chapters of, in your opinion for the Nanjing. I, this is just the first step and I'm hoping that other people will continue doing research on the nature. And finally, I thought I'd close with a quote from Li Hong Liu. Um, he's, a, he's a modern scholar of the classics. I had the good fortune of seeing him. He came to Five Branches and spoke about the Shang Han Lun. And he's also on Heiner's site. Um, there are several interviews with him about the Shang Han Lun. He says, the more of us in the field who study these texts effectively, and the closer we come to grasping their essence, the closer we will come to the level of the great masters. This is the most fundamental significance for studying the canonical text today. So thank you very much, and um, I'll open the floor for questions now and turn it over to my committee. <laughs>